Hello out there and welcome to the 11th uh, Urban Lunch Talk by JPI Urban Europe. I hope you are doing well, that you are enjoying a nice lunch or maybe just had enjoyed a nice lunch. At least here in Europe, it's lunchtime. I know we have people joining in from other continents. So very welcome to you too. As you know, we have some wonderful guests with us here today. Um, and you should be able to see them here on the screen soon. We have uh, Cecilia Betossi, who will facilitate us. And she, you are, I should say, <laughs> an urban governance expert and architect. And we have Lilian Mupende, uh, Van Siga, you're an independent consultant in sustainable urbanization. We have Karina Landman joining us from uh, South Africa, and you're an associate professor at the Department of Town and Regional Planning at the University of Pretoria. And we have Bahanor Nashia, and you're an architect, film producer, and project manager of Place City. Uh, welcome to all of you, and we will soon hear more from you. And just a few words to all other participants who are listening. You are welcome to type in the chat throughout the whole talk, and you can drop your questions in the Q and A function on your screen. We don't have time to uh, let everyone come on screen and talk, but we hope that you can still enjoy listening to our guests and um, type whatever comments or reflections you have in the chat. Let's see. I'm Caroline Rangsten. I work at JPI Urban Europe. We are an intergovernmental research and innovation initiative on urban transitions and sustainable urban development. I know there are some new people here today who maybe haven't heard of us before. Uh, if you have any questions on how we work or what we do, uh, I have my colleagues in the chat throughout this whole talk. Uh, so don't hesitate to ask anything about us. But today is not about us. Um, we want to see who is in the room uh, and what you're interested in. So you will soon see a poll on your screen. And in this poll, you can vote on um, which urban dilemma that interests you the most. JPI Urban Europe, we use urban dilemmas as a focal point for research and innovation. And uh, you can vote on digital transitions in urban governance, from urban resilience to robustness, sustainable land use and urban infrastructure, or inclusive public spaces for urban livability. I know it's a tough choice to just pick one, but for now, we pick one. Okay, some of you have voted. I will soon close the poll in three, two, and one. And here are the results. The majority of you are interested in inclusive public spaces for urban livability. We also have some infrastructure people here on second place. Thank you very much. If you're interested in what we mean with urban dilemmas, you can have a glance at our strategic research and innovation agenda available on our web. So these dilemmas that we're talking about, but innovative governance as well um, are part of or in the similar discussion as many other policy documents, both global and European. 
And we found some quotes, for example, in Agenda 2030 on this. You can see them on your screen. And in there, it is written that the new agenda recognizes the need to build peaceful, just and inclusive societies that provide equal access to justice and that are based on respect for human rights, including the right to development, on effective rule of law and good governance at all levels, etc. But we can also see governance in the EU urban agenda. Uh, we picked out these two quotes. Firstly, it's about um, a balanced, sustainable and integrated approach towards urban challenges should, in line with the Leipzig Charter on Sustainable European Cities, focus on all major aspects of urban development, uh, etc., in order to ensure sound urban governance and policy. It is also written that effective urban governance, including citizens' participation and new models of governance. Is highlighted here. So on this backdrop we will discuss innovative governance in a second and when we asked you to register for this event you submitted so many nice comments on what you're interested in in this talk. Obviously we can't go over all of these but we still wanted to Put them on a slide so you see what you what interests you have in common today and we've given these to today's guests to see if they're able to frame the talk a little around what you're interested in having said this um i think i'm gonna give the floor to today's facilitator cecilia and I will try and bring all of our dear guests on video at, uh, already now, because it's nice to see each other. So let's see if you can put on your videos and, uh, and your sound. Okay, I think everyone are unmuted, but the videos are not on and we're working on that. Cecilia, can you hear me? Yes, hello. Um, indeed, um, hello everybody. Um, just a minor technical issue. It says that I cannot uh, turn on the video myself because it stopped from your end. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, one second. Okay, maybe if everyone uh, can hear me, I could already maybe start while we try to uh, solve this issue. Hello? Yes, we can hear you, Cecilia. Ah, yes. okay, good. Cecilia, so, this is Karina, I can also hear you. <laughs> <laughs> Great. <laughs> Hello, Karina. So let me start while, uh, while uh, you solve the issue, Karine. Um, so, uh, Hello, everybody. Very nice to be here with you uh, today, uh, in audio at least. Um, I would like to thank you very much, uh, GPI Urban Europe, for organizing these discussions. Uh, I have the feeling they will become even more relevant uh, regarding the, the situation that we are facing now. Uh, at least many of us, I suppose, uh, are experiencing uh, this lockdown situation. So. 
uh, we might want to use this uh, special moment in time as an opportunity to reflect on urban dilemmas and maybe anticipate uh, future, uh, future topics. Um, as Caroline mentioned, um, I am Cecilia Bertozzi, I'm an architect and urban planner and I work for UN Habitat, which is uh, the United Nations program for human settlements uh, with a mandate uh, to work for socially and environmental, uh, environmentally sustainable cities. So UN, UN Habitat collaborates with governments and local partners to improve living conditions for all through sustainable urbanization. And sustainable urbanization is seen as a driver for, uh, for development and, uh, and peace. We try to prom promote transformative change uh, in cities to uh, address current challenges. Current challenges, uh, many of them are well known, climate change, uh, social inequalities, safety, uh, resilience, those challenges that were also mentioned uh, in some of the questions that uh, you from the audience addressed uh, uh, in your uh, subscription to this session. Speaking of challenges, it's also difficult not to address the, the current situation. I am working from home, even if you can't uh, see it uh, right now. Um, I suppose uh, many of you are in the same situation. Uh, and this experience of lockdown and social distancing is, uh, is indeed challenging. Uh, I suppose many of us uh, are looking forward to when we will be able to go out again and go to that uh, nice park, uh, in my case, uh, go to the market, walk in the streets. Um, it's so maybe also useful as a moment as it can help, help us realizing how fundamental uh, those social relations are. And also, by consequence, how fundamental public spaces and uh, physical places are, as they are the, the places in which most of these uh, exchanges take place. So this can uh, bring us to a first point, which is the importance of well-designed urban places to empower the, uh, and enable social, social relations and social life. And my first question for today's discussion would be, how to ensure high quality public spaces, uh, how to ensure a high quality built environment, which strategies, uh, which governance models, uh, which innovative governance models uh, do we have out there, uh, which tools or mix of tools um, have been tested and what could we share and learn about those experiences. Uh, a second challenge uh, that we can easily uh, address uh, will be the economic consequences of the current situation. Uh, I'd like to invite you to uh, have a look on the website of um, UN Habitat. Uh, today, a key message has been issued on the situation of, of the COVID-19 and what it uh, implies uh, in terms of uh, urbanization, sustainable urbanization rights uh, uh, for all in terms of, of quality of life. The economic consequences uh, are very hard to, uh, to anticipate. Uh, it's really not my field, so I'm not able to do so, but at least we can anticipate that there will be uh, economic consequences. Which raises uh, the second question. Uh, if now already uh, many cities are facing diffic difficulties in financing uh, adequate public spaces, uh, this will probably be even more the case uh, after this period of, uh, of uh, economic uh, uh, struggles, let's say. Uh, so which alternatives do we have? What alternative solutions are out there? Uh, which examples of smart use of local resources? Uh, and when we talk of resources, we talk of uh, physical, material, economical resources, but also of people. So I think that the cases presented today uh, will bring some ideas of possible answers to, to, to those two questions. Um, and uh, let's, now let's get the session started. I'd like just to uh, mention, uh, as Caroline was uh, saying, uh, I, have, I had a look as well at the questions that were uh, raised by the participants. Uh, I sort of group them into four main points. Uh, one uh, is the question of uh, having concrete examples, sharing 
best practices, but also failures, uh, ba basically concrete examples. A second one is about social inclusion, uh, the social inclusion dimension, but also the co-creation, how to involve the citizens. Um, the third point is the question of the governance, which model of governance. Uh, we can talk about multi-level governance, uh, the role and responsibility uh, of uh, local uh, governments, uh, the bottom-up and the top-down relation. And the fourth point is uh, to address the cu current challenges, as I, I mentioned uh, just before. So um, this question for me link very much with what you can see now on the screen, which is the declared actions uh, from uh, the World Urban Forum 10, which took place last February in Abu Dhabi. Uh, the topic was cities of opportunities, connecting culture and innovation. Uh, I put here just three uh, small sentences from this, uh, the current actions that you can also uh, easily access from the website of your inhabitant, or maybe they are now shared uh, on the comments, um, which says that cities have the opportunity to take the lead. So the first point is cities are seen now as the scale when, where these uh, changes or many of these changes uh, are going to happen or could happen or should happen and also the scale uh, through which we could address at least some of these challenges so this is what the first point is about uh, second point strategic integrated urban planning provides the tools to address those challenges uh, the notion of integrated urban planning is very interesting and important because it brings the, this inclusion dimension and also this transversal uh, dimension and also this multi-level uh, dimension, which is also highlighted in the third sentence that I put here. Innovation and cultural heritage must be at the foundation of how urban centers operate, which strong support from national governments, a strengthened role for subnational sub and local governments and a systematic collaboration with civic society. So, here we address uh, the two other topics of the uh, uh, multi-level governance where everyone plays in, uh, his role and the, in the, the fundamental integration of the civil society. This is a point uh, that is highlighted uh, many times in this uh, declaration. So I wanted to highlight this uh, almost perfect correspondence between the, the question that were uh, rise or the topic that were considered as uh, important to be touched upon, and this declaration that comes from the WUF. Um, just a very uh, last point before giving the floor to the uh, speakers uh, is this question that uh, the, this uh, World of One Forum was focused on the link between innovation and culture, which uh, can be a bit challenging to grasp. Um, but when you, in my view, at least my interpretation, while innovation by itself, so innovation is there to push, push forward and to allow uh, this evolution which is needed, culture is grounded in the specific place or area. So innovation without, without culture might become disconnected, maybe even de dehumanized. Uh, while innovation as a part of cultural heritage uh, will become, innovation can at one point become uh, this cultural heritage uh, of the future. So for me, the link between the innovation and the culture is um, somehow a way to push forward the need of place-based solution. That solution that are innovative, but, but really that take uh, aim from the culture of the place and are uh, then uh, really binded and linked strongly to the place. Um, with this, I think it's uh, really time to give a floor for, uh, to the uh, speakers uh, for uh, a total table and a short presentation. Uh, so I might start by uh, uh, Liliana. Floor is yours. Yes, thank you. Can you all hear me? Yes, we can hear you, but uh, we don't have video. We don't know if Zoom is blocking this because it's a very high pressure on them. So we're looking into yeah, it, probably. but please uh, wing it and uh, use your voice. <laughs> All right, great. I'll try my best. Um, Thank you. Uh, it's very difficult to do this in two minutes, but um, I'll give it my best. Uh, I'm an urban planner, urban and regional planner by profession, and I've worked um, in different capacities for the government of Rwanda, uh, then later in private sector, and then entered into 
to uh, consultancy, which is where I'm, I'm at right now. Uh, what I speak to, I will be speaking to uh, primarily in my role at the city of Kigali as the director of uh, One Stop Center several years back, but also as a resident of city of Kigali and uh, Rwanda, because this is something that's applicable to date and uh, applies to uh, ways that we handle some of our urban challenges um, in Rwanda. So um, my focus is going to be mainly on community engagement. We have what we call uh, Umuganda. Umuganda loosely translated um, is um, what we would call community work. And in this case, we take full advantage of uh, what people in the society or in the community can contribute um, towards their urban um, environment. Um, this is governed through uh, a very good decentralization policy that we have in place. And uh, most important in this structure at this point is uh, actually the low, lowest level of uh, administration um, of the city. This is actually what we call um, uh, Mudugu Dulida, uh, who is a, in, you know, in easy translation, a village leader or a cell similar to a village cluster. Initially, it used to be equivalent to about 10 homesteads, but with the expansions of the city and the growth of cities in, in, in Rwanda, it now captures um, you know, a larger number of households. And um, this village leader uh, then consolidates the community through what we call Umuganda. Umuganda normally takes place once uh, a month, every last Saturday of the month. However, initiatives that have been started during this day then translate into much bigger investments or commitments by the community. Uh, one of the things that um, or a number of the things that we've been able to uh, address is things like uh, building homes for vulnerable uh, uh, people in the society. Uh, this includes, um, you know, women-headed homes, um, um, child-headed homes as a result of the genocide and all. Uh, we also have uh, upgrading initiatives, you know, initiatives towards public spaces, solving public building issues, repairing schools. Um, you know, developing uh, small village offices or sector offices and things like that, all coming from contribution from the community. And this is done through uh, several ways. You will have manpower or labor that is um, committed by the community. You will also have um, funds that are com uh, committed directly by the community. So therefore, we are also kind of um, catering to the limitations of the government's or the city's commitment uh, the fact that they will not be able to fund all initiatives, then the community in itself um, contributes either through labor, through uh, funds, or even through um, material. Uh, this has over the years then translated into um, what we call a mayor's award and the best villagers are awarded. And we also have uh, then the transfer of successful initiatives across the board through um, the, the governance uh, structure of RALGA, which uh, is local government agencies that cluster together to compare and, and learn from each other through different initiatives. Uh, one thing that's unique about Rwanda and the city of Kigali is that in principle, we are actually homogeneous because we are one cultural group. We speak the same, we eat the same, you know, we get married in the same way, we have children in the same way. So everything is pretty much more or less uh, homogeneous. Uh, except for difference in backgrounds of education and things like that, that, you know, can then influence different ways that people prefer to do things. But uh, most importantly, the inclusivity aspect is captured when we're talking about income. We live in a mi mixed income neighborhoods, but we have to be intentional about keeping this in place uh, because a lot of times as cities grow uh, economically, then we have challenges in terms of um, managing that balance or being able to cater for social um, social equity and and um, and uh, distribution of resources. So in well, slightly more than two minutes, and in a quick nutshell, um, that's what I would be introducing to this uh, discussion. The value that we got from engaging the community through Umuganda, uh, which, as I said at the beginning, is loosely translated into uh, community work or community work day which also acts as a social gathering and people are able to know each other and know the challenges that we are facing among each other and we're able to support each other uh, not only on urban issues but even sometimes on other social issues that uh, play a crucial part of our, our community thank you thank you very much liliana and uh, thank you uh, we will have the time to go more in detail on this uh, on this very interesting example uh, i now uh, give the floor to uh, karina uh, and 
if you didn't see it, you can now turn on your uh, your uh, video. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for this opportunity. It's great to be with all of you. Um, yeah, I think, um, as Cecilia said, uh, we stand together and at least we can still speak, although we're working from home and we're trying to get through this. Um, so yeah, from me, from my side, um, all the way down in South Africa, um, I've got a background in architecture, urban design and planning. Um, and I've been involved um, with many other people on research, um, focusing on public space, um, urban and sustainability through resilience and regeneration and issues related to that. I'm really interested in this topic today because I think, um, you know, as we always say, um, no man is an island. So I think it's very important to look at coordination and cooperation that's really essential to get things done um, and also to move from the nice plans. Um, I think urban designers, architects, we, we do, we, we, we're so interested in making the beautiful plans, but it's really a challenge to get those onto the ground and to work with people and to try and involve um, them and to translate that into something that can be meaningful to people. Um, so how, how do we really get that innovation through governance practice? to allow for um, uh, to, to allow for um, working with the changes working with the people those kind of things and, and not to be scared to try um, because I think on, from our side um, in South Africa from the governance side there's always a uh, you know people are very scared to try new things um, so the innovation that Cecilia was talking about how do we get this through um, and also I'm interested to find out what others are doing, especially in terms of rethinking and remaking public spaces. Um, so I will share some of our experiences with you in terms of um, how people have reimagined um, uh, uh, public spaces, how they form new kind of um, uh, groups, associations um, to, to try and get to more inclusive spaces, especially in a country like South Africa, um, uh, the diversity, we cannot even begin to explain the level of diversity here. So it's really a challenge, but I do believe firmly that um, that public spaces, once we allowed back in them, can, can make a difference in that regard. So I look forward to speaking to all of you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Karina. And now I give the floor to uh, Bahanur. Hello, my name is Bahanur Nasia. I'm the project manager of Play City. Uh, Play City is a project financed by uh, uh, Urban Europe and um, we are in the middle of the project. We are collecting tools, placemaking tools from all over Europe and want to share it with, with everyone. And besides tools, we also want to have a framework where the placemaking uh, is utilized to activate places and to involve citizens and um, some uh, certain stakeholders and in both cities where we taste, uh, test those, like Oslo and Vienna, the context is totally different. Next. So we are collecting tools, but we are collecting all the projects. So if you have any projects, also my, my partners from, from, uh, from Africa, if you have projects, feel free to share it with us. Uh, we are also uh, featuring placemakers and uh, try to show uh, what their struggles or, and achievements are. And we also publish activities so uh, all our partners can have better visibility. And as I said, the tools are published on our website and we also try to um, give background infos in collecting stories, how these projects in, in public space and, and so on um, uh, came together. Next. Um, within the project, we uh, in the first year, we interviewed all placemakers in Vienna and in Oslo and uh, try to put them together in a uh, publication. Uh, if you go on this link, uh, you will be able soon, not yet, <laughs> soon to download, download this publication. And for us, it was um, 
very important to understand what the struggle of placemakers are in, in the cities and um, to understand how we can support um, their work. And um, it was also a little bit surprised to see that it's not on, only about finances, how to do the projects, um, how to start projects and how to continue projects. It's much more, it's um, uh, the, the placemakers, people who are active in, in public space uh, need so much more than just money um, to be successful with their uh, projects. It's, first of all, we need uh, to trust those people who really put their hearts in their projects, their whole, uh, full creativity. Uh, we have to understand them, give them the respect they, um, they, uh, they need and um, we have to enable them by even visiting them, enabling, inviting them in our cities, in our neighborhoods and so on. So it's not only about having the right policy, the right funding, but also trust and support and help um, so we can um, better improve our cities together. Next. If you have any questions or would like to learn more about the tools we gathered, or if you have any stories or tools to share with, uh, with others, uh, you can easily contact us. And yeah, we would be happy to hear about your projects also, and yeah, also present our projects. Thank you. Thank you very much, Bahanur. Um... Uh, from uh, my side, I'm going to give a very short presentation of uh, our project uh, Urban Maestro. Uh, unless we will first have the polls, Caroline? Yeah, maybe we'll first have the polls. Okay, let's see if our participants are with us. Um, let's see here. And you will soon see another poll on your screen, which you can vote on. Do you think that innovative governance is needed in your local administration, city or municipality? Please vote and I will soon close the poll. Okay, three, two, one. 100% yes. <laughs> okay, and one, one more poll. How do you, who participate today, how do you understand innovative governance? We will soon dive into it a bit more. Please take all the options that you relate to this topic. So you can take as many as you want. We have participatory processes, peer-to-peer -peer collaboration and learning new tools for governance or planning, a combination of informal and formal processes, or bringing more stakeholders to the table, and so on. And we will close the poll in three, two, one. And we should be able to see here, change in decision-making structures was rated quite high. Also new tools and a combination of informal and formal processes, participatory processes as well. Okay, Cecilia, it sounds like you can take it from there. <laughs> Speaking of Urban Maestro. Yes, thank you very much, Caroline. Um, so I'm uh, at Yon Habitat. We are. I'm working currently on a, a research project uh, called Urban Maestro. You have here a um, preview of our new website, which will be launched at uh, end of this month. Um, and I think you have the link uh, to go to the website that was uh, already shared uh, before. Um, 
Urban Maestro is a research project uh, founded by uh, the European uh, Union under the um, Horizon 2020 program. Uh, what, the, what it focuses on is exactly this aspect of uh, governance uh, uh, for the urban design and alternative or innovative strategies for the governance of uh, urban design. Um, why alternative or of innovative? Because we, the project starts from this feeling of frustration by recognizing that uh, in Europe we have uh, many, many regulations, uh, very detailed, uh, sometimes uh, even too many of them. Uh, everything is described in a very precise way. And still, when we go out, and uh, we can definitely see that uh, not all the urban places out there have a good quality. Uh, not all of them are vibrant or uh, um, inclusive or harmonious or even pleasant. So how does it come? Uh, and maybe it means that uh, all of those regulations are not enough to achieve uh, quality urban spaces. And of course, uh, the quality of urban places in cities is something that is necessary, necessary to enable uh, people to have a, a better uh, quality of life. Uh, and better living conditions. Uh, so what Urban Maestro does is to focus on, uh, on the, what we call the soft power modalities of urban design governance. It means when we speak of tools, we can maybe recognize that there are these hard power tools, so the regulations, these top-down um, uh, tools, and then there are many other tools that are more soft power, or sometimes bottom-up, uh, where the um, public authorities act but in a semi-formal or informal capacity as enablers or brokers uh, rather than through regulatory or direct investment powers. Um, so the project started with um, an overview of uh, the European situation. Uh, we conducted a survey to have an idea of which um, architecture and urban policies uh, were uh, existed out there in the different uh, um, member states. And we collected all of these experiences in a survey, which is also available on, on, the, uh, on the website. And uh, we are now uh, starting, we are now entering the second uh, half of the project. So we are start, uh, entering now our second year. And the idea is to uh, focus on specific examples and cases that we highlighted as uh, particularly interesting because they develop uh, new ways of doing. Uh, which might be very general, but um, it can go from um, a new way of doing competitions where uh, the focus is not uh, on um, uh, the, uh, the cost or, or the uh, financial uh, uh, aspect, but is more on the quality criteria, and those are really put forward. Or it can be um, uh, something like uh, a test that is uh, now um, going in the uh, French city of Grenoble, uh, where the public administration is um, testing a way of doing public spaces in uh, an incremental way, means that they start with uh, very small interventions that are meant to be temporary, very little money, and then they see how the space is used if the intervention is able to answer to the needs of the people, so there's also sort of participatory process uh, ongoing, and then they uh, improve the uh, intervention with more money and but still in a temporary way and these continue with those uh, continuous feedback from uh, the users uh, until when um, a project is set that uh, in a confident way we could see uh, answers to the needs and is really fit for for the purpose and then uh, more money is invested this is also a way to try to address uh, those financial shortcuts that we many city can experiment uh, and also a way to try to convince those who are not uh, uh, very convinced of the of this solution to just experiment in a very small way with little money and uh, little time and then see if the results are convincing and then being able to go forward. Um, a second example that I could give is um, uh, what is uh, now tested in several cities in, uh, in Italy, uh, namely in Turin where uh, the, administra the public administration um, open up to the citizen, let's say, for the management of the urban commons. And there are um, 
contracts that are signed between the public administration and the citizens uh, to allow many different ways of taking care of those urban commons. So um, it can go from um, the citizen has the, the right to clean up a specific uh, public space, the public administration will provide with the tools to do it, or uh, to uh, until the point of taking care of a building or using a building uh, for providing um, for association, for example. So there's a large panel, but it's a new way of doing things. Um, I stop with these two examples because it's uh, important to have uh, more time for discussion, but uh, please have a look at the website. Maybe if we go through exactly the second, just the previous uh, slide. Um, when the, the, the website will be published uh, within 10 days, uh, we will have a first map uh, of uh, innovative practices around Europe and you'll be able to click on the, on the uh, dots and see a description of what the practice is about. Uh, the idea is also to have it in a participative way. So um, the, the users of the website will be able to suggest practice. So if we go to the next slide, thank you. This is uh, uh, our call for submission. Um, we'll be uh, extremely interested in hearing of other uh, experiences and practices that you, um, you might uh, have in mind and you might want to share with us. And you can also uh, uh, join me directly. So now, uh, because of the timing, I'd like to uh, ask uh, quickly, Caroline, if there are questions from the audience that uh, then we might uh, ask our uh, uh, speakers to answer. Yes, we have um, a question from the audience. Mm. Uh, does anyone of you have an example of how a couple of municipalities, or many, have together cooperated from an innovative interurban point of view? Is one question. And we have one question for uh, Lilian which is that uh, saying amazing initiatives and very inspiring story of community involvement. Do you have a sort of pre-story? Pre pre how, how did it all started? Did this, commun this, uh, this community involvement and trust between government and community? What are the necessary preconditions? And do you think they're universal? So this is what we've had so far. Um, you can also choose to keep talking about this in the chat later on, but feel free comment Cecilia or the others. Uh, about the first question, maybe I suggest we could go, uh, Karina, maybe you uh, can start from there. Uh, yes, I can come in. Um, uh, from from our side in South Africa, we don't. I'm unfortunately not aware of uh, many municipalities working together. Um, as was the question, as was asked, um, uh, in terms of public space development. But um, there are examples of innovative practices within municipalities of how they involve communities, and then um, very uh, specifically in our case, um, how communities were then able to take. Um, first of all, how they involved communities and the private sector in terms of the establishment of new parks, but then later how communities were able to take that further through um, the formation of different groups um, that then came in to take care of the parks, um, similar to what you were describing in terms of what's happening in Europe. Um, so there are examples related to that um, that I can talk about, but uh, not directly to the question. Uh, okay, then Liliana, maybe you want to answer to the question that was specifically addressed to you? Sure, I will. Um, but just before I go to the question that was specifically addressed to me uh, on municipalities um, working together or cooperating, one of the um, institutions or agencies or maybe better put associations that has responded to this quite positively for us in Rwanda is what we call the Rwanda Local Governments um, Association. Ralga. Uh, Ralga, definite, uh, what they primarily do is they bring together all the local governments and then they map out successful stories where we've, they've not been necessarily successful and the reasons behind it. And then there's normally an exchange um, uh, structure. It could be uh, through written documentation and sometimes it's actually through gatherings, different um, 
mayors and their key uh, technical people are able then to gather and share the successful stories. And, and that's how we transfer one successful thing to um, another uh, local government or even we actually um, have uh, joint interaction. Uh, but coming to, back to Valeria's uh, question about um, how this all started, um, I think it, it, it came, it goes you know, back several, several years. We've always lived typically in clans or in, in clusters of homesteads in one compound or in one um, 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 you know, boundary or one uh, perimeter. And ideally, the way of managing um, social interaction, the way of managing um, uh, people's com contributions into that clan has always been um, you know, communal and has always been very engaging. Now, where we were able to actually elevate this to the level of using it as a tool for government and community to interact and work together was when we realized that you know, um, we have what we call homegrown solutions that we are now elevating in different perspectives. So one of the ones that I've cited here is Umuganda, but I could also mention another, which is Gachacha. Gachacha is our local courts that we have used to address um, the issue of the genocide that took place here in Rwanda. You know, fully acknowledging that you know a typical solution would not have been um, successful in the, in the context of our society. So what has happened is that this is something that's been practiced over the years, but then uh, the government and the community has then given it a new twist. You, we've introduced ways to make it much more productive. Uh, we actually now have started to have whatever contribution comes from the com community. Uh, actually, um, it is um, monetarized. So whether it's labor, whether it's um, um, uh, material that's given in, in kind, this has actually been monetized and becomes a part of what we call the government's budget or a part of the local authority's gov budget. So this is given value. It's not just that uh, the community is contributing and then tomorrow you have no idea what this contribution translated to. There are ways in which this is monetized and then it's given value. Um, I think it is very possible to actually translate it uh, to uh, universally uh, because it's all about, I think, leadership and governance and how it's approached. And one of the things that makes it very easy to, to succeed or maybe in some cases actually fail, depending on how it's approached, is that it's at a very decentralized level. You know, it's very decentralized. Therefore, you're actually de engaging directly with the community. The community see this village leader and the opinion leaders every day. And so we engage in different ways. And now with social media, you're actually able to use WhatsApp and you know, Twitter and other aspects to be able to create groups or to be able to create ways to interact even much more um, effectively. So the idea behind this is that I think it is something that can be replicated. Uh, and we've been able to start it at a certain level and it's now uh, elevated to something that's very crucial uh, to our urban development, but also to other initiatives outside of uh, urbanization. Thank you very much, Liliana. I'd like to address uh, a question to uh, Baha Noor about uh, this uh, topic of transferability, because I suppose that working on two very different places is something that you've been touching upon. And just uh, uh, to anticipate then, I'd like to um, ask Karina if she could share a bit uh, about her view on this um, mix of soft and hard power tools for the uh, governance of urban design and how and if this can also help uh, facing a situation where uh, there is complexity, uh, the evolution of societies, the, the evolution of cities uh, and maybe uh, towards the implementation of, of project. Thank you, Bahanur. The floor is yours. In our case, uh, we have a direct collaboration between Oslo and Vienna and in uh, the cities, both cities are project partner. Um, the cases are different. In Oslo, we have, uh, we are working around a high school which uh, has uh, female pupils, uh, students. And in Vienna, we are working in public space in uh, one periphery district. So the cases are different. Therefore, the division of the municipality is a difference. So it's not, uh, you can transfer uh, and collabor uh, collaborate um, in direct sense, but you can translate and um, exchange the approaches and uh, talk about visions and empowerment. Um, what 
also is a part of both projects is that we tried from the beginning to reach out to other uh, units in the city because this is also the um, if you if you operate in public space, you have so many different divisions of the municipality, from street um, management to facades to to ground floors and shop uh, regulations and so on. So you have a lot of different units which have their own agenda, r rules, um, requirements, and so on. Uh, so the biggest um, collaboration necessity is in the collaboration and and bringing all those needs together and break them down in terms of human needs and reorganize them around what we as citizen need because um, in Europe we have the history at least of 100 200 years where regulations were inherited and developed and you we figured out in Vienna, if you or in in also, if you want to do something in public space, you face so many barriers because you have to apply in so many different units. You have to understand so many different regulations that it's already um, frustrating to get started. And it's um, so bringing all those um, units from municipalities together and to understand, we have to make our rules around the people and not that people have to adapt to the rules is I think um, not very common practice or point of view. Therefore, I um, we experience a um, big, uh, big uh, moment of uh, understanding. Thank you very much, Bahanur. Um, Karina, maybe you could share a bit uh, more with us uh, about the, experience, uh, the experiences in South Africa. Uh, thank you very much. Um, yes, um, in South Africa, as uh, we found that often some of our most innovative work um, is uh, when there are uh, partnerships between um, government and maybe the private sector, where they start using, as you mentioned, um, softer governance tools, um, where, for example, there was one case, the development of a park, um, they wanted to have some of the public land and adjacent um, for the development of offices in a big um, uh, shopping center or big uh, kind of area with shops. Um, so they negotiated that the private sector building that would come in, um, completely redo, remake the public space um, on their own costs and they would make it available to the public. And then they would also continue maintaining that in the future, um, all at their cost, but it remains on public land and it remains a facility open to everybody that's used every day. So that's a wonderful example of how um, innovation com can come in to, in the end, serve everybody that can still use that and it's continuously maintained. So the issue of limited budgets there in that way um, is overcome. There's another wonderful example um, from a previous marginalized area in the south of Joburg, um, where after they've developed that, one of the big challenges we have in South Africa is how to keep on maintaining these areas. And in that case, the community came together. They formed several different um, local groups, um, a group responsible for the maintenance, um, the park is to cause a park, a group responsible for safety, a group responsible for activities taking place there. Um, all of them work with the respective public sector groups like the safety uh, group works with the police, um, the, 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 the maintenance group works with the city council and so on. And in that way, um, a number of years after this investment was made, it's still one of the most beautiful and well-used parks in the City of Johannesburg. So it's just another example of how a community can come together and how different um, uh, tools at a local level, very, very micro level, um, can come together to, to start um, creating innovative, innovative ways to, to address um, the issue around the, the, the um, maintenance and also the establishment of public spaces. Thank you very much, Karina. Uh, very interesting examples indeed. Uh, I suggest that, uh, so we are uh, very quickly arriving at the end of the session already. Uh, so I suggest that uh, maybe Karen shares, shares with us one or two questions from, uh, from the audience and then 
we do another uh, through the, the tab, but uh, with one sentence each to try to wrap up um, our discussion. I know it's a difficult challenge, but let's try. Yes, hello from Green Room. Um, we have a few questions here. I was wondering if Simone, your question, if you could specify a bit in the chat and perhaps our speakers can answer uh, in the chat and linger a little bit. And then we have one question to uh, Lilian. I was wondering what was the name of the Rwanda best practice example? Uh, could you also please share a link in the chat maybe of this best practice example that you talked about so everyone can have a look. Uh, a question for all of you is what is an effective way to persuade municipalities to try out new innovative projects? Okay, thank you. I, I'll give the floor to Liliana, just the first uh, short sentence on, on this last one. Uh, from what we are uh, seeing, a good way is to, to test, uh, so to use sort of testing experimental um, strategies uh, that again are maybe temporary, so also using these temporary uh, architecture strategies uh, to, uh, to allow testing of solutions with little means, little time, um, and so it's easier to, um, uh, to get the approvals of everyone for something that is more temporary and not uh, asking for uh, many resources. This is one of the conclusions uh, of the result we, we can share. Liliana? Okay, uh, thank you very much. I think for us, what's been successful, I mean, uh, Rwandan cities are, are competing, I think, because we're a young country in the context of trying to innovate ourselves in so many different ways. There's a lot of competition be between each other. And so I think for us, one of the, the tools or the ways that has been very beneficial is trying to bring in competition between the different uh, municipalities, but even within the different uh, local neighborhoods that form these municipalities. And like I said earlier, um, we are monetizing um, all the initiatives and involvement. So whatever the community brings in is monetized and it comes back to bring value to what the city or the municipality or the district or uh, that specific neighbor, neighborhood has achieved um, as a whole. And, you know, we have a, a competitive structure that goes from decentralized levels at the lowest right up to the top um, of the government. So for us, competition has been um, the best tool, I think, or the best way, effective way. Thank you, Liliana. I ask one last uh, se wise sentence from Bahanur and then from Karina, and then we will have to wrap up. In our case, um, I think we can summarize that we need to listen better to our citizens. So in, in case of Oslo, for instance, there was uh, an implementation of um, basketball uh, field in front of the school and the students wanted to have a football uh, soccer uh, playground. So all those things we just need to listen and then we wouldn't make such such uh, wrong investments uh, which are not uh, hearted by the by the people who use it and the second thing is empowering we don't as as my colleagues also said we don't need a lot of budget it's the trust that we have in the people who are placemakers architects designers uh, achieve or uh, regular citizens who want to do something it takes a lot of time, a lot of energy to spend it on public good. Um, and we should just facilitate that as cities. And if we do listen and empower those who want to do something, then I believe it will be better. Thank you very much, Bahanur. Karina, one last sentence. Uh, yes. <laughs> I think from what we've seen in the country and the people in the communities we worked with in projects, um, one lesson would be to be open to work with change, not to be afraid to try new things and to, to test those things. And if it fail, fails, then we just adapt and we, we go forward again. I think the most debilitating thing is to sit there and not to do nothing. Um, and to do nothing, um, not to do anything. So I think they, um, that, that would be, um, if, if, we, if I can summarize in one way, um, 
all of the greatest, most innovative projects we've seen in this country in terms of public space development has been um, by trying out new things. And then that becomes a good example in practice that others can follow. Thank you very much, uh, Karina. I think I can only uh, agree with uh, all of uh, what has been said uh, now. Uh, I won't uh, add anything apart from the fact that it's a bit frustrating. Uh, I know for everyone this uh, um, short formats, but uh, again, I'd like to uh, thank uh, GPI Urban Europe for organizing them, which uh, we recognize is a, is a huge work. Um, all of the so I, uh, Carolina, I think you are going to give some more uh, details uh, on the fact that the, the chat is going to remain open for uh, 15 minutes. Um, and uh, all of the uh, contacts, I believe, have been shared. Uh, but uh, I, I speak for me, I, I'm, I can also give my uh, contact details uh, and uh, uh, via the website of the project, you can also contact uh, Urban Maestro. So, Carolina, maybe you want to conclude? Yes, so I see it's a lot of activity in the chat. Yeah. So please, um, both Karina and Lilian and Bahanur and Cecilia, jump in, see what you can discuss there for a bit and respond to what you felt wasn't brought up in the short formats. Uh, our next Urban Lunch Talk is planned for April. Uh, it will be on the topic of urban land use and infrastructure. What is the dilemma? Uh, in this topic and if you want to make sure you receive an invitation you join our newsletter and meet with us in our social media until then so thank you all lovely to meet you and see you in the chat for a little bit okay thank you bye bye <laughs>